Chapter 32 The window of the Henford department store in Naprikop reflects a stranger, a young woman wearing a long blue dress and a modest gray felt hat with a ribbon. Tita examines herself carefully, but still doesn't recognize her. She can't accept that she is the stranger, her reflection in the glass. The days the German... The day, the day the Germans entered Prague, she was a nine-year-old girl walking along the street holding her mother's hand. Now she's a woman of sixteen, on her own. She still shakes when she remembers the shudder of the tanks crossing the city. It's all over, but in her head nothing has finished. It will never end. After the jubilation of victory and the celebrations marking the end of the war, after the dances organized by the Allied forces and the pompous speeches, post-war reality shows itself for what it is, mute, harsh, and without fanfare. The bands have gone, the parades are over, and the grand speeches have been reduced to silence. The reality behind peace is that in front of her is a country in ruins. She has no parents or siblings, no home, no studies, no belongings, apart from the clothes they gave her in the Civilian Assistance Society, and no way to survive beyond the ration card she was able to get after a great deal of cumbersome paperwork. On this, her first night in Prague, she'll sleep in a hostel set up for the repat repatriated, the only thing she has is a scrap of paper with an address scribbled on it. She has looked at it so many times she knows it by heart. War changes everything. So does peace. What will be left of the sisterly relationship she shared with Margit in the concentration camps now that the war is over? Margit and her father thought Dita and her mother would take a transport train a couple days after them, but her mother's illness delayed her return by several weeks. During that time, Margit could have made new friends. She might want to forget everything that happened in the past, like Rene, who greeted her from afar without stopping. The address jotted, jotted down by Margit's father belongs to some non-Jewish friends with whom he'd been out of touch for years. In fact, when they left Bergen-Belsen, Margit and her father didn't know where they'd go to live or what they would do with their new lives. They didn't even know if those friends of theirs would still be at that address after all those years of war or if they'd want to have anything to do with them. The piece of paper is getting wrinkled in, her palm, in the palm of her hand, and the writing is becoming illegible. She wanders through the northern part of the city, looking for the address, asking people and trying to follow their instructions along streets she's never been in. She no, she no longer knows her way around Prague. The city seems enormous and like a labyrinth. The world appears colossal when you feel small. Finally, she reaches the square with the three broken benches they told her to look for, Number 16 of the street on the piece of paper is close by. She goes inside the main entrance and rings the bell of apartment 1B. A somewhat overweight blonde woman opens the door. She's not Jewish. Fat Jews are an extinct species. Excuse me, but do Mr. Barnet and his daughter Marguerite live here? No, they don't live here. They've gone to live some distance from Prague. Dita nods her head. She doesn't reproach them. Maybe they waited it's taken her so long to return to Prague that it's too late. After everything that's happened, it's not enough to just turn to a new page. You have to close that book and open another. Don't stand on the doorstep, the woman says to her. Come in and have a piece of freshly made cake. No, thank you. Please don't bother. Someone's waiting for me, in fact. A family commitment, you know. I'm off. Some other time. Dita turns around to leave as quickly as she can and makes to walk away, but the woman calls her. You're Edita, Edita Adler. And Dita stops. She already has one foot on the stairs. You know my name? The woman nods. I was expecting you. I have something for you. The woman introduces Dita to her husband, a man with white hair and blue eyes, who is still handsome at his advanced age. The woman brings her an enormous piece of hazelnut cake in an envelope with her name on it. They are such kind people that Dita doesn't hesi hesitate to open the envelope in front of them. Inside are two train tickets and a note from Margit, written in her schoolgirl hand. Dear Ditinka, we're waiting for you in Tablis. Come right away, a huge kiss from your sister, Margit. A person waiting for you is... A person waiting for you somewhere is like a match you strike at night in the countryside. You may not be able to light up everything, but it does show you the way back home. While they were all eating, the couple explains to Dita that Mr. Barnet found work in Tablis. And he's living there with Margit. They tell her that Margit spent ap entire afternoons talking about her. Before she leaves for Teplis, Dita has to fix up her papers, just as they told her in the Jewish council office. So first thing in the, mor the next morning, she stands in the very long line of the office that issues identity papers. Hours of waiting in line again, 
but it's not like the lines in Auschwitz because here people are making plans as they wait. There are also angry people, even more irate than those who waited at, in a half meter of snow for a watery bowl of soup or a piece of bread. Now those who wait are irritated by the delay or because they, they've been misinformed or because the number of papers they need. Dita smiles to herself. Life is back to normal when it's small things that annoy people. Someone joins the line right behind her. When she sneaks a look, she realizes it's a familiar face, one of the young teachers from the family camp. He also seems surprised to meet her here. The librarian with the skinny legs, he exclaims. It's Otto Keller, the young man who people said was a communist and who used to make up stories about Galilee for his pupils. Dita immediately recognizes that ironic look of intelligence that used to intimidate her a little. Now, though, she sees something special in the young teacher's eyes, a special warmth. He doesn't just remember that she was a companion in the camp at a critical moment in their lives, but he discovers a thread that unites them. They have hardly spoken, Block 31. In fact, nobody ever introduced them. They are two people who seemingly have never met, but when they bump into each other in Prague, it's as if they are two old friends meeting again. Ota looks at her and smiles. His lively, somewhat roguish eyes are telling the girl, I'm happy you are alive. I'm happy to have found you again. Dita smiles at him, too, without really knowing why. She is immediately infected by his good humor. I found work doing the accounts in a factory, and I found modest accommodation. Though if you think about where we've come from, you'd have to say it's a palace. Dita smiles. But I hope to find something even better. They've offered me a job as an English translator. The line is long, but it seems short to Dita. They talk without pause, without any embarrassing silences, and with the confidence shared by old comrades. Ota talks about his father, the serious businessman who always wanted to be a singer. He had an extraordinary voice, Ota explains with a proud smile. They took away his factory in 1941. They even put him in jail. They sent. Then they sent us all to Terezin, and from there to the family camp. In a selection of July 1944, when they broke up Camp B2B, he didn't make the cut. Ota, so resolute and talkative, notices that he's choking on his words. But it doesn't embarrass him if Dita sees that his eyes are moist. Sometimes at night I think I can hear him singing. And when one of them looks away to remember a difficult or painful moment from those years, the other one also turns their eyes toward that same point to which we only allow people we trust completely to accompany us. Those who have seen us both laugh and cry. Together they visit those moments that have marked them forever. They're so young that telling each other about those years amounts to telling each other about their whole lives. What will have happened to Mengla? Have they hanged him? Dita wonders. Not yet, but they're looking for him. Will they find him? Of course they will. Half a dozen armies are looking for him. They'll catch him and put him on trial. I hope they hang him straight away. He's a criminal. No, Dita, they have to give him a trial. Why waste time on procedures? We are better than them. Freddy Hirsch used to say that, too. Hirsch. How I miss him. It's her turn at the window. Time to resolve all her issues. That's it. They are still two strangers. It's the moment to wish each other luck and say goodbye. But Ota asks her where she's going. She tells him she's off to the Jewish community office and asks what they've told, and asks if what they've told her is true, that she can request a small orphan pension. Ota asks her if she'd mind if he accompanied her there. It's on my way, he says, so seriously that she doesn't know whether to believe him or not. It's an excuse to stay with her, but it isn't a lie. Dita's way is already part of his path. A few days later in Teplice, some kilometers from Prague, Margit Barnet is sweeping the entrance to her building. As she sweeps, she daydreams about a young man who does deliveries on his bicycle and rings his bell merrily each time he cycles past her. She thinks that perhaps it's time to start paying more attention to her hair in the mornings and putting a new ribbon in it. Suddenly, out of the corner of her eye, she glimpses the shadow of someone coming through the entrance. You're a very fat girl, the person shouts. Her first impulse is to give a rude response to her rude neighbor, but then the broom almost falls out of her hand. It's Dita's voice. Margit is the older of the two girls, but she's always felt like the younger sister. She throws herself into Dita's arms in the way little children do, not worrying about the speed, not holding back. We're going to fall, says Dita, laughing. And what does that matter as long as we're together? It was true. Finally, something good was true. They were waiting for her. Have a good day, friends.